thank you everyone. So no guinea pigs today. However, we do have subatomic particle slushies. All right, so my mission today is going to be to convince you to join a certain sector of the dark side, specifically those of us who work with solid state detectors. So we've already had a couple of colloquia in this series talk about the evidence for the existence of dark matter. So I'm not going to go over all of this again. Uh, I think you're all convinced that the dark side exists and is extremely important to controlling the galaxy and crushing the rebels. Um, I mean, um, to understanding the fundamental composition of the universe. Uh, so just to remind you, uh, we uh, currently hypothesize uh, that uh, about 70% of the universe is made up of dark energy, about a quarter of it is dark matter. Uh, and we have this highly successful standard model of particle physics that defines the other approximately 5%. And from a particle physics point of view, we are essentially looking for all of the fundamental building blocks of the universe and the ways in which they interact with each other. So we are seeking to build on this standard model by adding something, but we're not quite sure what. It's not changing online. Yeah. Oops. It's a little bit slow. I'll just sit here. Okay. <laughs> uh, I should have brought one of my guinea piggies to operate the computer, obviously. Uh, yeah. Um, although a guinea pig operating a mouse would be a little bit iffy. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so far, uh, all of our uh, all of our evidence for the existence of dark matter comes from astrophysics. Uh, so what I deal with in my career is how to look for dark matter in particle physics experiments in labs here on Earth. So catch a plushie. Oops. Well, it's hard. See, it's hard to detect. Okay. Uh, so I will start with the Basic questions, what are we looking for? We as a dark matter community, and then what am I in particular looking for uh, in my little sector of this? Um, the, what I call solid program for solid state detectors. Uh, and uh, finally, I will give an introduction to super CDMS, cryogenic dark matter search, uh, where we have a vibrant research group here at University of Toronto, and I see uh, several of my research group members in the audience here. Say hi. Uh, and so if you want to help uh, take over the galaxy, get on board with us. All right, uh, so what are we looking for? Well, from a particle physics point of view, uh, searching for dark matter we view as searching for beyond the standard model particles that have a few properties that are suggested to us by astrophysics requirements. Uh, so uh, they have to be cold in that they move generally at non-relativistic speeds or look like little penguins. Okay. Um, they have to be stable on cosmological time scales, and they have to interact gravitationally because this is how we see their effects in astrophysical observations. Uh, plus, um, we are uh, hoping that they have uh, some feeble non-gravitational interactions with uh, standard model particles and possibly with each other. Uh, well, we've been looking for it for at least a few decades now. We think it's always there, but we still haven't found it. Uh, and then as well as just finding it, we wanna answer several important questions about it, such as what mass scale is 
it at, uh, what, if any, are its interaction mechanisms with the standard model? Uh, are there uh, actually dark forces or the dark side of the force, if you want to prefer to look at it that way? Um, and uh, how many new particle species might there be? So a good starting point uh, is uh, this uh, general, fairly simple possibility for the production of dark matter in the early universe through what we call thermal production. Uh, so how this works uh, is that a very, very short time after the Big Bang, in other words, when the entire universe was still at a very high temperature, uh, we could suppose that the dark matter was initially in thermal equilibrium with the standard model all mixed together in some sort of hot soup, like something you would not want to sample at the cafeteria. Uh, so we'd have dark matter and their antimatter partners annihilating to produce uh, standard model particles and their antimatter partners and vice versa. Um, and then uh, as time progresses onwards, in other words, as the temperature cools, uh, so note that this temperature axis is actually going from hot to cold, okay? Um, the standard model particle pairs um, become no longer energetic enough to annihilate with each other to produce dark matter pairs. Um, and so the reaction uh, only goes one way uh, and the dark matter starts to annihilate away and its overall number density and its relative fraction in the universe compared to other components drops until the universe has expanded and cooled enough that actually the dark matter stops annihilating with itself and uh, here is where then the number density and the relative fraction of the dark matter gets so-called frozen uh, so if you thought uh, freeze out was what happened uh, last week when the temperature suddenly got colder outside, uh, no, when I refer to freeze out, uh, it, is, uh, it is actually uh, when the so-called relic density or essentially number of dark matter particles left over in the universe becomes, becomes established and constant. Um, and so the idea is you can then work out what that relic abundance of the particle would be uh, based, on, based on its average interaction cross-section times velocity. And what you end up just by doing some back of the envelope order of magnitude calculations uh, is that if you have a dark matter particle of a mass of about 100 GeV, in other words, 100 times the mass of the proton at so-called the weak scale, you get the relic abundance that we actually observe from astrophysics. And so this leads to the idea of, of 100 GeV dark matter candidates uh, called weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. Uh, so this was a very nice story, which was uh, at first called the WIMP miracle. Then we had a problem, which I call wimping out. Uh, which is that uh, we have lots of sort of wimpy style candidates uh, from particle physics theorists, uh, things like uh, supersymmetry, extra Higgs bosons, extra dimensions, et cetera. Uh, but uh, a few decades of searches actually have not uh, found wimps where we most expected to find them. Uh, and that's in the um, mass range sort of near 100 times the mass of the proton. Um, and so, uh, these uh, lines here all represent various experiments uh, that uh, have looked for the WIMPs and have ruled out all of these areas of parameter space above here. Uh, so then that leads to the question, uh, well, what's actually going on? Uh, and so this has then uh, opened up what I call the zoo of dark matter candidates, uh, which is to look at uh, other possibilities, other BSM theories, uh, which, uh, which could give rise to the dark matter. Uh, and this was a uh, sort of conceptual plot made by one of my colleagues. And uh, as you can see, it's vast. Uh, each of these circles sort of represents another theory or another category of theories um, that um, my uh, friends on the 11th floor and their colleagues have managed to cook up for us. Uh, and it's a little bit bewildering. 
so I focus on one particular little park in the particle zoo, uh, where you actually stick with the uh, sort of overall thermal relic story for the dark matter, is it turns out that it does work theoretically uh, down in mass to uh, about uh, twice the mass of the electron or so. So we can go all the way down from sort of 100 GeV down to the GeV scale and even down to the scale of the mass of the electron. And there you get what, what we sort of call light or wimp-like dark matter. The reason uh, that this wasn't sort of the first thing that we started looking for was that it also requires new low mass so-called dark mediators or dark force carriers. In other words, you have to use the dark side of the force. Uh, there are a number of BSM frameworks that use this, uh, such as a hidden valley or mirror universe models, especially those which have so-called dark photons in them. Uh, be careful with this one, it's heavy. Yeah. Um, and so um, I look for uh, the uh, sub GEV, sort of light wimp-like dark matter, and also uh, for possibly these very low mass dark mediators. All right, so next question, how are we looking for it? Uh, so how do you go about using the dark side of the force? Okay, uh, what's really important here is what I like to call complementarity between different types of experiments. Um, so there are collider type experiments like at ATLAS where you smash standard model particles together, try and produce the dark matter particles. And these types of experiments uh, have been going lower and lower in terms of the mass range of the dark matter particles that they can probe. Um, but it still generally uh, tends to target uh, higher mass wimp-like particles. And there are also indirect searches uh, where what we actually look for is signatures of the dark matter particles annihilating with each other, for example, in outer space, uh, and their standard model decay products, things like gamma rays and protons and antiprotons and positrons and so forth, we can look for with things like space probes. Uh, and we had a colloquium looking at that a few weeks ago. Uh, and then uh, there's uh, the type of experiment that I work on, which is direct detection, where we essentially uh, put a target uh, standard model detector uh, here on Earth. Uh, we wait for a dark matter particle to wander in and hit our detector uh, and, and create some tiny little perturbation in it. So yes, we have our standard model and then our dark matter, which comes along and, and gives it a little nudge. Uh, and so the idea here uh, is that we are essentially all on a giant spaceship called Earth, okay, and we're actually moving through this halo of dark matter particles and our speed relative to the halo, we can also look at as the speed of the particles in the halo relative to us. So they were actually will be hitting our detector here on Earth with a velocity of something like 270 kilometers a second, okay, so they're actually really slamming into us. Uh, and even though we think they would be very feebly interacting, um, if, there is, um, if, 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 if there is enough opportunities uh, for these dark matter particles to interact with our detectors, eventually we hope to do, uh, be able to pick up the signatures of at least a few of them. Uh, so when the dark matter particles do collide with our detector, they uh, uh, we think they have a, a, a tiny probability of being absorbed or causing nuclear recoils or causing electron recoils. The challenge uh, with looking for GeV scale and sub GeV scale dark matter, okay, um, is that this really stretches our traditional, as I call them, WIMPy direct detection techniques which rely extensively on inelastic nuclear recoil. So the thing is that if you have lower mass dark matter hitting a nucleus, there's essentially not enough energy transfer from the little dark matter particle to the nucleus for us to be able to actually see the nucleus recoiling, okay? Um, and so then when you look at these exclusion plots in parameter space, we have generally the interaction 
cross section on the y axis, the dark matter particle mass on the x axis, and um, you sort of hit a wall here um, where the mass of the dark matter becomes too small for us to see the nuclear recoils. And then you also uh, hit uh, a wall here in terms of the interaction cross section, which uh, essentially the shape of this wall is determined by the interaction rate, which has to do with the density of the dark matter, but it's also proportional to one over the mass. So there's our challenge uh, for, for the light wimp-like dark matter. And then if we want to look for, um, say, the um, uh, KEV scale or lower dark mediators, you actually need absorption searches. Um, so, uh, so we have uh, this sort of space of nuclear scattering searches. Um, electron scattering searches uh, where you can actually get a lot more momentum transfer from a low mass dark matter particle to it. So then we have a better chance of seeing the electron recoiling. Okay. And then at even lower mass, the absorption searches. So our main challenge here is to lower the mass thresholds and the interaction thresholds that we are sensitive to. And just to give you uh, a brief idea here. Um, this uh, was uh, a plot that was made in the context of a, a sort of planning exercise for the next decade or so of experiments in the community. Uh, and uh, this uh, filled uh, off-white contour here shows sort of where the current direct detection bounds are. And then near-term experiments is what's planned for sort of the next decade or so, and then the blue area is far term, which is sort of R&D that's going on right now for experiments that would actually come online at a time scale beyond that. And so you can see for the nuclear scattering and the electron scattering and the absorption searches, we have uh, vast ambitions for expanding our reach across the galaxy and conquering, uh, I mean, uh, for uh, exploring uh, large swaths of this parameter space. So where do solid state detectors fit in? Uh, well, uh, let's see, if this is my dark matter particle and I want to find him, I can try a few different little solid state types of detectors and you know, see what he ends up sticking to. Um, there are essentially three main channels for our next generation of these types of detectors. Uh, one is hay, one is wood, and uh, no, uh, no, that's for guinea pigs. Uh, no, uh, one is uh, phonons, uh, which are quanta of vibrations in a solid lattice structure, uh, which also can manifest uh, as uh, heat uh, if you uh, also are dealing with uh, vibrations in a liquid. Um, there's charge, um, which is basically a result of electrons getting uh, excited or kicked out of their atoms by the dark matter interactions, uh, and you can have light, in other words, photons. Uh, so the advantage uh, to the uh, phonons or heat channels is that you can get much lower detection thresholds. In other words, you need a smaller energy deposit for the detector to actually register something. Uh, but the advantage of the charge on the light channels that you can get discrimination between electron recoils and nuclear recoils, which can tell us a lot about what type of interaction on a basic particle physics level was happening in there. And um, several of these next generation detector technologies are solid state. Uh, so, uh, so these are the ones that I'm going to focus on here. You can, you can categorize the uh, types of detectors uh, by, for example, their recoil energy that they can detect uh, and the mass of the dark matter causing that recoil that they can find. Um, so uh, the uh, not solid state detectors, uh, so things like a giant tank of liquid argon or a giant tank of liquid xenon, uh, uh, sort of uh, 
peters out uh, at a much uh, higher dark matter mass than the solid state detectors. Uh, and the type of solid state detector that I work on specifically uh, is this uh, category uh, that uses uh, semiconductors where we can detect recoil energies on the EV scale and uh, mass of dark matter, uh, hopefully uh, maybe uh, down to uh, even the MEV scale. So uh, if you look, uh, again, this is just sort of another way of visualizing the parameter space that we are exploring with different technologies uh, in terms of the dark matter mass that we can see in scattering processes, the dark matter mass that we can see in absorption processes. These are all solid state technologies down here. Um, and uh, again, uh, this, is, this is the range that I work with uh, involving things like semiconductors. Okay, next secret about how to join the dark side uh, is you have to have an underground shielded layer. Okay, you have to hide your detectors in shielding and bury them in an underground clean room. Why? Well, that's how every evil villain does things, right? I mean, and just kind of by default. No, actually, the real reason is backgrounds, backgrounds, backgrounds. Okay, so background is basically any process besides the one that we're actually looking for, okay, that creates a signal in the detector that mimics the signal that we are looking for, and this essentially confuses us. And what you need uh, is as high a signal to background rate as you can get. So one of the main sources of backgrounds is what we call cosmogenic. Uh, and the root of this issue is the cosmic rays sent out by those evil rebels. No, actually, it's not by the rebels. It's by all kinds of astrophysical phenomena, including the sun. Um, so uh, there's not only cosmic ray muons uh, that uh, come down all the way through our atmosphere, uh, but then uh, there's all of the products that you can get uh, from the showers that they set up. Um, if they hit a material uh, here on Earth, uh, they create things like relation neutrons, and um, you can get uh, what we call activated materials, which is essentially the creation of, of some radioactive isotopes. Um, and uh, we can, of course, make uh, fairly advanced uh, simulations uh, that now show us you know, um, what is the remaining cosmogenic background rate if we bury something underground, plus we put layers of different types of shielding on it. Uh, then there's also environmental sources of background. So for example, uh, airborne radon. You've probably all heard about people having radon in their basements. Uh, so this is a naturally occurring radioisotope in the Earth's crust. Uh, when you go underground, it's like going into a very, very deep basement. Uh, so there's no escaping the radon. Uh, you have to you know, uh, somehow uh, filter it out of uh, your experimental environment. Otherwise, the airborne radon uh, and uh, also radioactive isotopes all along its decay chain uh, can cause you problems. Uh, and then there's radio impurities in uh, all kinds of other materials, like uh, even the semiconductors themselves that we use for our detectors. Um, you can have um, radio isotopes in those crystals, uh, no matter how much we try to purify them, we cannot get rid of all of them. Uh, and then even things like the uh, metal support structures that we use to hold everything up. Uh, you'll get the odd atom of, believe it or not, uranium sitting in there. Uh, so, uh, so, so that is essentially the importance of, of, of burying our detectors, not only underground, uh, but, but under a whole bunch of shielding. Okay, uh, so now that you have your underground shielded layer, what is it that you're gonna put in it? Uh, the most sort of intuitive or straightforward thing that you might think of uh, is, well, if I want to detect dark matter, why don't I just try to take a photograph of it? Uh, and it turns out that you can use a technology actually similar to what you might find in your cell phone camera uh, called a charge coupled device or CCD, which is basically made from semiconductor pixels. Um, where you have 
um, ionization events in these semiconductor pixels induced by dark matter interactions instead of by photons. So in your cell phone camera, you have a photon coming in and exciting an electron or multiple electrons in one of these pixels uh, of a semiconductor from the valence band into the conduction band. And this creates a tiny electrical signal. And then your camera puts together the signals from all of the different pixels to make an image. Uh, so if we put this in our shielded underground layer instead, hopefully you have no photons hitting it because it's stuck in a dark little box. Um, and so if something uh, comes in and excites one of the electrons, um, it's not a photon, hopefully it's dark matter. Um, and so um, just uh, to sort of give you an idea uh, of uh, the size scale of this technology, the pixels uh, are sort of on the order of, of tens of micrometers. Uh, on each side, and they're uh, a few hundred micrometers thick. And there's a special type of CCD called a skipper CCD, which can reliably detect excitations as small as one electron in a pixel. So this is a really small energy deposit. Um, so this is what one of these uh, arrays of CCDs might actually look like. And then if you zoom in uh, on one little area of it um, and you take an exposure, so you know, literally you, you leave this sitting there for like an hour or several hours, um, you will get photographs uh, of, of all kinds of subatomic particles uh, like alphas or muons or electrons and things. And hopefully if you bury this under enough shielding, you won't actually get these standard model particles getting through the shielding. And, and hopefully all that's left in your image is dark matter. Um, and you can actually uh, see uh, the individual electrons in the pixels. So if you, um, if you count up in your exposure, um, how many pixels, have different amounts of charge that were deposited in them. You can see these peaks here from zero or one electron or two electrons and so on. This is really cool. Um, uh, so you have to operate them at something like liquid nitrogen temperature so that thermal excitations uh, don't essentially cause pixels to fire spuriously. Uh, and then you lock it in some scary looking chamber like that. Okay, isn't that awesome? Um, with uh, some sort of cryogenics equipment attached to it. Uh, so there's several uh, of these uh, take a picture of dark matter experiments going on right now. Uh, there's one called DAMIC, dark matter in CCDs uh, at Snow Lab. Uh, and there's been another one uh, called Sensei, sub-electron noise skipper CCD experimental instruments. Atlas people, don't give me a hard time about those acronyms, okay? I mean, atroidal LHC apparatus, come on. I mean, this makes you guys look good. Um, and then uh, there's uh, another version of DAMIC uh, that, that's, that's uh, gonna come online soon, hopefully. Uh, and there's this other collaboration that sort of tries to unite a whole bunch of these other collaborations to take over the dark side uh, called Oscura. Yeah. Okay, uh, then we can get a little bit more creative. Uh, every good fan of sci-fi knows that you know, every takeover the galaxy device has to have a crystal in it somewhere, right? I mean, if it doesn't have a crystal, it's just, sorry, this is, you know, not gonna be the super weapon you were looking for. Okay, so cryogenic semiconductor crystals, the idea here is don't just collect the electrons, also collect the phonons. Uh, so those are those quanta of vibrations in the solid structure that I mentioned. Um, and rather than sort of relying on tracking or imaging, actually do uh, essentially pure calorimetry. Uh, so, so how much energy was deposited in this crystal? Um, and so uh, you then essentially have a dark matter particle wandering into the crystal, having some sort of interaction, creating uh, a bunch of uh, so-called uh, non-thermal phonons. Um, you of course do also have some thermal phonons potentially floating around. 
uh, which is why you want to operate your detector really, really, really cold, or one of the reasons you want to put it cold. Um, so we here actually tend to go down to tens of millikelvins. Okay, so that's like colder than liquid helium temperature. Um, and then you have uh, phonon sensors that are attached to your crystal. Uh, so this is uh, what these devices actually look like. This is an example from Super CVMS. Okay, so you can see this is the actual crystal. Um, it's uh, on the scale of about a kilogram. Okay, and then you can see here the sensors that are actually etched on the top base of it, essentially. And then it goes in shielding, and then it goes in this uh, scary looking contraption uh, connected to all the, the readout and the cryogenics. And so if you have a combination of both the phonon and the ionization channels, you can do nuclear recoil versus electron recoil discrimination by looking at what we call the ionization yield, which is just essentially a ratio uh, of uh, how much energy was deposited in the ionization channel versus how much was in the phonon channel. Okay, um, and then um, you can see um, that there's you know, two very clear, very separable bands corresponding to nuclear recoil events versus electron recoil events. Uh, so uh, this is not only what super CDMS does, but we also have a partner experiment called Edelweiss, uh, which shows that we can make silly acronyms in just about any language. This is Experience for Detecter les Wimps en Sites Souterrain. Okay, uh, and then uh, you can do something uh, even a uh, little bit potentially weirder, um, which is, uh, take the phonon signal and instead of collecting the ionization signal along with that in semiconductor crystals, you can collect light in scintillating crystals. So a scintillator, just a reminder, is a material that gives off light uh, when something like a charged particle interacts with it. Um, and these uh, also operate at very cold temperatures. Uh, and this is uh, an, an example of, of one of these setups uh, that uses a crystal of uh, what's called calcium tungstate. Uh, and here you have a combination of the phonon and the light channels that allows you to distinguish nuclear recoils from electron recoils and gammas through the light yield. So this is essentially the same principle as before, but here you're taking the ratio of energy in the photon channels to energy in the phonon channels. Um, so an example of this uh, is the uh, so-called press experiment. Cryogenic rare event search with superconducting thermometers. Yes, these are great. Okay, uh, so the experiment that I work on and that my team works on, hi everybody, is super CDMS. So this is the cryogenic semiconductor crystals uh, where we have uh, phonon, phonon channels and some of our detector modules also have ionization channels. So it's not just a cryogenic dark matter search, it's a super cryogenic dark matter search. Okay, what makes it so super? Well, you're about to see. Uh, so until about uh, 2015, uh, the previous incarnation of the Death Star, um, I mean the previous version of this experiment, operated in an underground lab in Minnesota. Now we are constructing a more powerful version in Canada's world leading astroparticle physics facility, which is uh, in the uh, secret snow lab layer, two kilometers underground uh, in the Valley Creighton mine near Sudbury. So you have to go all the way down and then kind of sideways through more than a kilometer of muddy mine tunnel, and then you get to our secret lair. And uh, yes, some people who have gone there uh, have actually come back and lived to tell the tale. They've actually survived it, right, Lucas? Right, Tyler? Yeah, okay. Uh, and so you can see uh, that we have a, a rather complicated piece of apparatus going on. And, and, and we have a cryogenic, system, we have uh, several layers of shielding. Um, and then in the inside of the cryostat, inside all of that shielding are the semiconductor crystals. Uh, so these are uh, 
kilogram scale detection modules of silicon and germanium. We have six modules stacked in a tower, uh, and then we put uh, multiple towers into this cryostat. And our first operation uh, of the entire SuperCDMS Snow Lab experiment are expected next year. What we already have operating what's called CUTE. Uh, so this is a giant room of guinea piggies. Uh, no, that would be incredibly cute, but no, that's not what we have. Um, it's the cryogenic underground test facility at Snow Lab, pretty much right next to uh, where the full SuperCDMS setup is going to be uh, and it's for essentially dealing with individual detector modules or just one tower of modules um, and this uh, lets us do things like calibrations and background measurements and some r d work and we actually uh, are very excited about what we call some early science data so some actual world leading or very close to world leading dark matter searches that we can already do at this facility So what makes uh, super CDMS so super? Uh, well, uh, it's uh, our low detection threshold and it's our extremely good energy resolution. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, our charge channels and about our phonon channels. So the charge channels uh, use what we call high electron mobility transistors. Uh, and these are essentially low noise amplifiers uh, on the face of the crystal to read out really small ionization signals. And our phonon channels um, are made from uh, what we call transition edge sensors read out by squids. I mean, of course, every evil army has to have a bunch of like, squid soldiers, right, that, you know, overrun the entire city and, and uh, probably someone has to call Aquaman at some point. Uh, no, actually, uh, these are uh, superconducting quantum interference devices uh, that read them out. Uh, so essentially, um, a TES uh, is uh, short for transition edge sensor. Um, the ones that we use are made out of tungsten. And uh, we keep them uh, right at what's called their critical temperature, which is on the scale of like 10 millikelvins or so. Um, and that means that it, they're right on the border between being superconducting and being normal. Uh, and so a very, very tiny energy deposit is enough to push it over the edge into this normal state, um, which then, essentially significantly increases the resistance or decreases the current in a tiny circuit. Um, and we can do the amplification of very, very tiny current signals uh, using these squids. Um, and so there's all kinds of actually very interesting condensed matter physics here, uh, which uh, sort of links with uh, what was actually discussed in our colloquium a couple of weeks ago. Um, about actually how we collect the phonons in these aluminum fins on the crystal face. Um, and what happens is the phonons actually break uh, Cooper pairs in the, the superconducting aluminum. And then you get the resulting uh, quasi particles diffusing uh, into the tungsten transition edge sensor, and that's what pushes it um, over into the normal regime. So one thing that is new in this generation of super CDMS uh, is a form of phonon signal amplification based on the idea that if you drift charge carriers in a crystal lattice across a bias voltage, this actually generates a cascade of what we call Luke phonons. So this is essentially because the charge carriers set the whole lattice vibrating as they move through it. Um, and so then um, what actually gets, uh, what actually gets started as a very small signal, then gets amplified by this cascade of Luke phonons that are 
produced um, such that the total phonon energy that you see comes from not only the primary recoil energy, but also this significant extra contribution from the loop phonon energy, which is the product of the number of electron hole pairs that you produced in the initial crystal interaction and the bias voltage that you are applying um, and the um, charge quantum Q. Um, and so there's a huge advantage to this in terms of lowering then the threshold of primary recoil energy that you need in order to get a total phonon energy that is big enough for us to register. There is one disadvantage, which is that you lose what we call true calorimetry. In other words, you have to do some work in order to figure out how much energy was actually deposited in the crystal based on just the total phonon energies that you're seeing. Uh, and we also lose the ability to discriminate between nuclear recoils and electron recoils. Uh, so that's why we actually have two different types of detectors that we're going to put into super CDMS. One of them uh, uses this high voltage scheme and it actually only has phonon channels. It does not have ionization. And then the other one uh, is what we call IZIPs, interleaved Z-sensitive ionization and phonon sensors, um, which um, does not use uh, this high voltage, uh, but it has uh, both the ionization uh, and the phonon channels. So we can use uh, the IZIPs for ER versus NR discrimination, which is especially useful for purposes like figuring out what processes were due to backgrounds and which were actually due to potentially dark matter signals. Um, and then uh, we have these uh, HV or high voltage modules uh, with a much lower energy threat. And I'm very pleased to be able to tell you that we have some exciting results from prototypes at test facilities already. Um, so uh, we have some uh, silicon prototypes, uh, which we call uh, HVEV, uh, the EV referring uh, to uh, the resolution, which is on the scale of electron volts. Um, and uh, these are gram scale devices. Uh, so remember I mentioned to you that the full super CDMS detector modules are going to be like kilogram scale. So these are just on gram scale for like R&D and test purposes. They're, they're, they're much, much, much smaller. Um, and so you can put them in a nice little holder uh, and put them in, you know, a much smaller fridge and so forth to read them out. Um, and uh, with this, um, you've already demonstrated uh, the phonon resolution at the level of a few electron volts, which allows us to see single electron hole pairs. Uh, so you all oohed and awed earlier when I, I showed you the single electrons in the, in the pixels for the CCDs, right? Well, we can do that too, um, or at least uh, the, same, the same basic concept. Uh, so here you can see uh, where we did what we call laser calibration, which is basically we shoot single photons from a laser periodically um, at the crystal. And um, sometimes it dislodges one electron, sometimes two, sometimes none, and so forth. Um, so you can actually see, see those nice little peaks here. And so uh, from just runs that we've done at test facilities, we have already been able to get world leading limits. Um, for example, this is a, a low mass uh, WIMP nuclear recoil search, and this is an electron recoil search. Um, the uh, the uh, black lines here uh, are from the uh, crest experiment with the scintillating crystals that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the, uh, the blue line is from the Edelweiss experiment that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this Purple line is from a previous generation uh, of the uh, CDMS experiment. And this red line uh, is the results uh, from our uh, prototype at the test facility, which you can see already has covered this new part of parameter space here. Um, and in electron recoil, um, you can see uh, what we call uh, HVEV run one and run two the blue and red lines here you can see are carving out this part of parameter space here. Uh, this is the CCD experiment 
dynamic that I mentioned earlier, and this is a sensei experiment that I mentioned earlier. And just with our prototype devices, you can see uh, there we are right with them. Uh, we can also do uh, dark absorption searches um, for things like um, dark photons and axion-like particles. Uh, so here, once again, the HVEV lines in red and blue here, um, and uh, this, this very large portion of parameter space uh, for these very uh, low mass critters called axion-like particles here uh, on the uh, scale of a fraction of a keV in mass. Uh, so these dark photons here, uh, in case you're wondering uh, why the plushie seemed a little bit heavy. Uh, so uh, if you get a plushie of a normal standard model photon, well, it's supposed to be massless, but they had trouble manufacturing those, but it's very, very light. It's like stuff with cotton balls or something. Um, this one is, is stuffed with a, a bit of a heavier material uh, because uh, unlike the standard model photon, the dark photon has a mass, okay? Uh, so uh, this is uh, 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 at the fraction of a keV scale also. All right, so I will, uh, so I will briefly uh, wrap up uh, why you should uh, come to the solid dark side. We have cookies and they're dark chocolate cookies. No, not necessarily. Um, and then um, I'm just gonna give a uh, shout out uh, to my uh, Super CDMS team here and the rest of our collaborators. Uh, so I hope I've convinced you that direct detection of WIMP-like dark matter uh, at the GEV and the sub-GEV scale through nuclear recoil and electron recoil is a well-motivated challenge especially when it's accompanied by searches for low mass mediators at, for example, the KEV scale and below through dark absorption processes. Solid state technologies, uh, uh, some of which I've talked about here, uh, cryogenic semiconductors, scintillating crystals and charge couple devices provide many advantages for such searches as demonstrated in recent world leading limits on low mass nuclear recoil, electron recoil, dark photons, axion-like particles, et cetera, including uh, prototype and R&D devices promising further discovery potential in the very near future. So stay tuned uh, to, for more news from our cryogenic semiconductor crystals at uh, Super CDMS. Uh, this was from a recent collaboration meeting. You can see all of the different institutions involved with this. Uh, also, a uh, shout out uh, to the Arthur B. McDonald Institute for Astroparticle Physics here in Canada, um, and of course to Snow Lab for uh, making Canada a leader uh, in this very exciting experiment. Uh, and a shout out to my group members, uh, several of which are here. Uh, Cork and Qubit send their regrets, but they did insist that I at least post a picture of them. They are HQPs. And so it calls them highly qualified personnel. We call them highly qualified piggies. Uh, so uh, our team members here are involved in various aspects of the experiment from sort of data handling, software simulations, analysis, calibrations, all the way to actual operations, underground acute, some aspects of the data acquisition system. And Professor Hong here uh, has. Uh, it has a nice ADR fridge in the basement uh, if you want to check out his not so secret lair uh, and uh, all of his people uh, who have so far survived all of their experiences in the basement. Uh, if, anything, uh, if anything ever uh, happens in the basement, uh, you folks will be the first to know. Okay, uh, so, uh, so uh, thank you all and I hope I will see you on the dark side soon.